Okay. Good evening to everyone. I will invite our guest to be on stage on my left, please. Very serious. Perfect. So hello to everyone. Thank you for coming to this conference. We had the great honor. We are so glad to welcome at Ensa Versailles the landscape firm from Singapore, Asia, landscape architecture salad, like a salad, <laughs> like a lettuce, we could say. So please welcome uh, Shang Wayan on my left, architect, founder of the firm, Go Yu Han, who is, she is the landscape architect and design director of Salad. And we have also Catherine on the, 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 the left, which is also landscape architect. And uh, we have also Sok Jun on my right, which is also landscape architect. And finally, Quentin, he has a French name. <laughs> Ça peut arriver à tout le monde. And Quentin will propose the talk uh, this evening. So Salad Landscape leads a practice that builds the possibility of coexistences of the wild, of the domesticated plants, animals, and humans. They show, in a certain way, how we could be different women and men in this post-anthropocene transition. <laughs> we approve it. So they will propose us a conference titled Mangrove Bank that is set within the framework of the C45 backstage teaching for master students, in which we discover through live and online meeting the practice of ASEAN firm, architecture and landscape one. In such country as China, Thailand, Singapore, Japan and Vietnam, so please make a warm welcome to Salad Landscape. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, it was a bit worrying initially, but I realized that, yeah, you did come. <laughs> you know, I, I was studying architecture as well, and it's, it's quite tough. I know you have to jog at the studio together with doing with lecture. Um, Quentin will be giving the talk today uh, with Yuhan supporting. What you're going to see is first we'll introduce ourselves, and then the second part is what we prepared for you today. Uh, it's not we as in uh, Salad and uh, Quintin, but uh, it's also together with uh, AI. Uh, we use Mid Journey together to produce a little story for you. Uh, hopefully it will become a good project uh, and we hope to exhibit around the world. Thank you. Hello, hello, hi. Hi, I'm called Quintin. It's a non français but I'm not French, I'm huh? Singaporean. Uh, why Quentin? I don't know. My grandmother gave my grandfather gave me the name, but uh, all along I was the only Quentin in Singapore. But when I come to Paris to uh, do uh, studies in one year, and I realized that there are five Quentins in the class, and uh, I didn't felt very special anymore. So, <laughs> so uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm actually an architect. Um, I work with Salad Landscape very closely um, in a few projects in Singapore, including the Singapore Pavilion, which was like my wallpaper uh, in Dubai. And we form a very good partnership. So now we run a collaborative studio together and we're trying to move uh, beyond landscape design. And we're trying to do architecture, uh, experiential design, curation, uh, as well as uh, digital technology. So what you see here is a, a lot of experiment, a lot of art, and 
we're not trying to promote the company that much, but we're trying to tell you a story, like a beautiful story. Yeah. So, uh, I hope you understand my English. So, mais mon français c'est pas uh, très bien. Hein? Donc, uh, c'est pas possible pour raison en français. Désolé. <laughs> okay. So, follow us on Instagram. It's the first slide. So who are we? Who we are? Not playing. Mm. Yeah. So um, what salad does, or what architecture does, is actually um, different scales. Uh, I think in architect, uh, we deal with different scales. So you can see f even from the species scale of the frog to the human, to the city, and then to the whole urban scape. So that is what the ideology is and the ethos is. We try to rewild the sky. And as you can see, this is the office. It's based in the old uh, race course. So it, this used to be horse racing. <laughs> so it's kind of like a Versailles school. And then we face uh, two sides. One side is a city, the other side is a hill, the tallest mountain in Singapore. Not so tall, yeah? Uh, yeah, so what we try to do in the little experiment in the office is try to bring uh, nature to the sky, something that is experimental, and if you see all the plants that we have, they are actually all in small pots. They are not in the soil. Yeah? So these are small pots, and yet they grew very big. And what the team does is we try to introduce a lot of uh, species like birds, I think stick insect, lizards. Every time I go there, there's something new. So it's a little experiment about rewilding, bringing ecology to the sky and to the urban environment. So um, today, Singapore is actually one of the greenest cities in the world. Um, in, in terms of urban scape, and they also try to reintroduce wildlife into the city. Uh, recent years, you can spot more and more of this wildlife, hornbills, otters, uh, I don't know what's that, some lizards, pangolin. pangolin, yeah. And there's always a concern that there's a lack of connection to us and nature. So Singapore always tries to reintroduce nature and wildlife into the landscape, just beyond, bef before, beyond just planting trees. So for us, we try to cap capitalize on the opportunity, and we said that you know in architecture we have a lot of um, metrics, you know, try to judge whether a building is good or not. We try to also introduce a metric of rewilding. What is rewilding and what is landscape to us? So in a very technical sense, we come out, came out with this eight um, criteria about what is uh, rewilding to us, and then we kind of judge each project, you know, whether or not there's environmental friendly features. Uh, do we use native flora and fauna? Uh, how's the water ecosystem like? And of course, uh, carbon sequestration, habitat. I think most importantly also, we try to bring in technology in a lot of things that we do. So um, even in plants, I think in Dubai Expo, which you'll see later, we try to put in a lot of sensors uh, and calibrate information and research and data to it. So that's how we judge our project, and this is what we base uh, the metrics by to give all the architecture and the landscape a certain age to it, just beyond planting green stuff on buildings, right? Too cliche. So what is beyond landscape architecture? Right now, the idea of the company, or rather what we do, can be broadly characterized into three of these big topics. There is the traditional bread and butter, the one that makes money, but we want to go beyond that. We want to do rewilding. That means we want to introduce ecosystems into urban environment. I think that is very important for us. And then the last one is through the use of digital technology in every step of the way, whether or what we do in processes and also digital technology in implementation and allow us to see different ways of seeing. So I think just now some of you are in the lecture, you saw the spectrum because as you understand, um, animals like birds, they see in a different spectrum and therefore it's important for us as humans to also see how the animals see things. And then we can design things that are more palatable to them. So the birds don't crash into the building, for instance. So this is um, rewilding the land. So this is actually one of my first projects with Payan. That's how I met him. <laughs> it's like a long love story, but it's not. <laughs> um, this is Enabling Village. It is a small uh, adaptive reuse school that is for autistic children. Uh, and we won the competition, but they didn't have a lot of money. 
So we propose a master plan to bring very, a lot of green into the area and reuse the classrooms. But the good news is because they didn't have enough money, they didn't have money for maintenance. And that's where ecology comes in. So there's a lot of planned ecology in this area that actually does all the maintenance for you. So we told the client, hey, you don't have to actually spend money on maintenance if you manage the ecology here because that's what it does, you know, free. And that's what happens. It's our little experiment. This is seven years after it's been built. Um, right now, I think almost every other week or every month, we do organize trips there to take away, you know, people try to throw their own fish inside, you know, when they buy from the market, they bought frogs or what. They are not native to the ecosystem. So we have to take them out and remove them to make sure that the ecosystem is balanced. So that is also a fun project. If you're ever in Singapore and you want to be a gardener or something, come join us. Of course, we try to bring in the greening to the sky. So these are projects uh, with Woha, uh, the previous company I worked for. Uh, we try to bring in uh, pellets of the plants that from the nearby mountain all the way up to the sky. So a lot of this has been done, and this is what we're doing, but we want to push it further. And we push it further here in Dalit Bay, Borneo. So it's a hotel nested uh, with the, uh, in uh, Sabah, Malaysia, East Malaysia. And then we have an eco park. That's what we try to do. So beyond just the hotel, at the front of the hotel, we're trying to build an eco park in front. And this eco park actually extends the hotel beyond the boundary line. So for the hotel owners, it's actually good for them because the guests get to enjoy just beyond what their boundary line is. They get to enjoy a bigger park. And what we try to do is also we try to rewild this area by building things like bed houses. Uh, we built a small little uh, pond, garden there, and coastal forest, a drinking pool for animals. And all these little areas are actually little secrets for the guests to kind of, you know, if you are daring enough to venture in, you find it. So all these things actually add value for the hotel. And again, they don't have money, so that's what we do. <laughs> Yeah, so you have the little fish from the drain going out, and then here, this is, this is our eco park. And it's the beginning of a new habitat that we are creating. So back then, this whole area is actually, there's no planting, and it's all, it's very terrible planting. What we do here is we, we introduce habitats here for ecosystem to grow. And of course, it be becomes a selling point and an attraction for the hotel guests and for people around the area. Yeah, you can see. Is it you? This is Yuhan, yeah? This is her. She's playing with the little kid <laughs> in the pond. I think one thing fun about the company is they actually send all these people to do all this work. <laughs> it's not the contractors. And it's really fun because you actually get your hands dirty and you actually learn a, a lot about this. So I also went down and carried some stones. <laughs> yeah. So beyond uh, architecture and landscape and ecology, we also do art. And I think that's very important for us because it, it allows us to express further and project beyond. I think one of the duty as an architect is sometimes we get too lost in fire codes. We get too lost in technical GFA calculation, you know, how much area we need this, you know. What art does is allows us to do that vision thinking that we learn in school to project it to the future. So this is in Melbourne. Uh, it's called Rewilding the Sky, so it's part of the pedagogy, and the roof gardens are here represented not just playgrounds for the rich, because nowadays it's very popular in, you know, in Boulevard Osman, you have all these terrace, you know, with garden, you know, it's all for rich people. We hypothesize that these terrace are actually for the animals, because most of the time in Singapore, you have all these beautiful roof terrace, but the fact is no one uses it because it's, it's bloody hot, yeah, très chaud because in, in the tropics, it's crazy to go up to the roof unless there's no sun. So we hypothesize why not change these roofs to habitats for nature, but projecting more into the future. And of course, we designed five different typologies. Uh, one more thing we did is in Venice. Uh, this is Venice. Yeah. With representation of half a forest and half a city. So how you can mix a forest and a city landscape together, like a dual uh, image of that. Yeah. 
So we always envision to have more natural reserves in the sky. We want to build up because Singapore itself is a city that is very compact and very narrow. We do not have enough land. So to allow more sequestration of carbon, we need to multiply the density of green. And this is how we envision it. If we can do it, nature reserves in the sky. So that's the idea. So one of the key experiments that we did, uh, that, that's where we, we, we started this experiment, is to merge these three things together. It's in Dubai. Through landscape, architecture, and digital. So this is the pavilion. I'm not sure how many of you went to Dubai. Uh, it is Dubai. It is that green. Uh, all real plants, by the way. And net zero energy and net zero water. So if you see the roof, there's some solar panels on top. It's fully covered with solar panels. No climatization, very hot, but it works uh, with no energy. And all the water is actually generated on site through a desalination. Yeah. So this is a little experiment that we did. And beyond that, it's not just about the architecture because this is a wow piece of architecture that we try to do as a prototype for people to get inspired by how the Middle East can change if you have just a little shift in the mindset that you can actually be this green. Because all these plants here that you see are native to Dubai. They are not from some uh, exotic lands. They are all from the Middle East region. And we also add in cute little robots. And these robots are doing more than just uh, for show. They actually monitor the plants. And they learn whether the plants are healthy, whether the temperature is good enough, whether there's too much humans. And they inform us through machine learning whether or not we need to change the plants uh, next week or something. So that's an important role here, and we have three of them. And this is also the fun part, because we kind of take this idea and translate it into a game. Uh, quite a fun game. I think during my time, it's a, like plant versus zombie, right? You just press the screen. So the amount of carbon that uh, the, 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 the solar panel has in a day gets translated into this game. And that's the amount of power you have for the game. And this is the amount of uh, trees you can plant in this game every day. So it's different. So it's a bit too simple because we are not game designer. I know there's a game design studio here. Sorry, we are not that good. But uh, this is what we did. So again, it's uh, not just architecture design. We try to go also a bit more fun and more digital by experimenting really something new. And we had to deal with uh, UX design as well from here. Yeah. Yeah. So we also had the digital art piece that was using all the data collected, not just for knowledge, but also for art, that to show, yeah, you can't, can't load. <laughs> oh, you have this, yeah. yeah. This is the sound of uh, Orang Selita, which is the original people that lived in Singapore. Uh, and this is their, their song, and then actually they had to went down and call them and then record it. So a lot of these uh, things that we put together seem very high tech, but it's actually very low tech, you know. It's, we just go to the forest and record the sound. And then a lot of these are hand drawn by Huayan himself. So during COVID, he was drawing plants every day, at least three or four plants. I think there are like hundreds of them. And we're trying to sell them as NFTs now. <laughs> Yeah. There's a lot of information here. You can follow our Instagram to get more because, uh, like, for instance, this is like a durian tree, but it's hybrid. Uh, I don't know if you all know durian. It's the best smelling fruit in the world. Yeah. And we kind of hybrid it with uh, the durian that the birds like and the durian that the humans like. Maybe not the French, yeah? but uh, maybe for the Singaporeans. So the lower durian is one that the people will eat because it's fresh, it's delicious, but the birds don't like it because it's not nice for them. So we mix the trees together, and on the top, the birds will take the ones that they like, that the humans don't like it, and then they will eat it, and then we will fertilize the ground with it. But on the bottom part, it's for the humans. So in a way, we kind of express altruism, giving back to nature through a single tree that's hybridized. So imagine a durian plantation that is full of hybridized trees. Is it a way for us to work together agriculture that doesn't damage the land, but also give back uh, to nature? Something to think about. Yeah, this is inspired by Monet. 
he comes out quite a lot here. <laughs> yeah. And the last thing is, after this two series, we had a whole um, screen to show the systems behind it. So, of course, we use uh, BIM uh, in the whole project. And in a way, it also exposed the skeleton of the building because buildings nowadays are alive. They are living. They have so much technology behind it, but yet they are all hidden. And we try to express that through this piece that from the water pipes that go in to the cones, to the steel structure, to the fans, uh, to the toilets, to the misting system, to the uh, pond, these are all systems acting together with the sunlight that is powering it. And then with the plants and layer, not yet, to form the whole pavilion. Yeah. So that is our uh, digital story. <laughs> yeah, wait for it to finish. So these are all the species of the plants that were planted on the cones. Ta-da! Yeah. So in, in all our projects, uh, so in all our projects, uh, I mentioned three things. The first is landscape, rewilding, and digital. So this is where the direction we're going, and this is the project that kind of exemplifies where we are trying to go at. So to sum up this theory that we have, before I bring you through the story, is this story of uh, 33, 33, 33. Because in, in, in our lives, humans, and when we design something, we always design for the human. And I think that's very selfish, because if you think about it, we are not the only creatures that inhabit this planet. We are just one of many parts. So we hypothesize that in the future world, the design thinking must be around 33, 33, 33. That means we take ourselves as 33 part of the pie. We leave the other 33% thinking for the species that inherit this earth among us. Of course, nowadays, uh, we live through TikTok and Instagram most of the time. But there is a new kind of species uh, coming up with AI that is also, you could argue, alive and also uh, its own universe on this, of its own. So we need to think about how we design and how we interact with that. And of course, you say, oh, 33, 33, 33. And then we leave the last 1% for the unknown. It's to keep our mind open for new possibilities because whatever we hypothesize today might not be the truth. And I don't think there is any truth, ultimate truth to things. We adapt as we go. I think that's the beauty about design and architecture thinking. So this is the unknown that is it. 33, 33, 33, and 1% for the unknown. So today I want to activate 1% of everyone's unknown mind. Uh, bear with me because this project is not a project, it's a story. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with uh, uh, if Invisible Cities. <laughs> the book okay should be right so it's something like that it's a story called the mangrove bank uh, and a story by us and it's illustrated by AI 100% um, by them uh, we didn't draw any of these images we just type into the computer easy right yeah so very nice comic sense form that uh, for our story time so 1% of your mind bring us through this journey of what is the mangrove bank so let me start by saying that, you know, in, in the whole world, where we travel the world, uh, Singapore is actually um, in the sea, right? And a lot of nations actually start off uh, in the past with the industries from the maritime. It's called a tessalocracy. <laughs> yeah. So this, this, um, these countries actually dominate the seas through trade routes, mining, uh, of course, Great Britain, colonization and all. And these are all empires, right? So this is not what we want, you know? It's like war, ghastly, oily, and in acrylic. <laughs> yeah. We hypothesize that there's another form of nation in the future. It's called the mangrove bank, and it's a ship that's not really made out of mangrove, but kind of looks like mangrove, that sails the sea, attempts to save the world through its 
whatever is inside the sea, and of course, it gathers salt and other minerals with its own economic system and parks around every single journey destination, saving one city at a time. How cool is that? <laughs> and this is a ship that has no boundaries, doesn't draw any lines, that goes around and colonize them with beautiful resources instead of taking it away. Stop playing. So I'll show you what's inside the, 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 the ship, right? It's a ship. Oh, it doesn't move. <laughs> So inside the ship, you can see there's like a bank, a cute little bank that exchanges a lot of data, a lot of trade. And within this bank, it's all people betting about the future, but they're not trading with uh, money. They're trading with maybe species, carbon. They're trading with fishes, uh, new habitats. They're trading with monkeys, perhaps, I don't know. And then they have different kind of currencies you know, maybe the bird currency, the orchid currency. Mm, I don't know what's that. Hundred dollar worth of mangrove. So they're actually trading whatever they have about their natural habitat and exchanging with each other within this bank. So in this, um, in this city, every life has their own asset. All nature uh, has its own monetary value. I think in the lesson just now, we talked about capitalism, right? I think capitalistic society might not be the end of anything because capitalist society assigns value to material goods and human needs. But what if the needs of nature will assign a value? That, then we will think differently. So in this city, in this boat, in this ship, every living being is assigned a value and they have a say in what they want and how they survive. But how did this mangrove bank started? You know, we show you that you know they go around saving the city. So, I'll share with you how we think that this mangrove civilization started. It started actually from humans, when they were the first kind of banks were, as far as we know, came from the desert, when nomads go around the desert trading goods and materials with each other, and this definitely formed the basis of civilization, trade and of course what we have today, a society with a market-based economy. So, fast forward more and more centuries, this is Medici Bank, uh, the bank of the heaven that promises you eternal life. And within this bank, there's like all these clouds in the sky. But all these clouds in the sky, it's actually desire and maybe greed, right? Because, you know, when you go to church, and they grant you a sort of desire for eternal life, a desire for something good. But throughout somehow, even in Singapore, we have certain people that use religion or this hope for something in the sky that is actually for nefarious means, for greed, for power, for something that they want dominance. And all this greed and dominance actually float up to the sky and pollute the entire planet. So this is where all your pollution comes in because people dream of being powerful, people dream of being rich, and what they do, they don't give a shit about anything. They pollute our skies, they build the real worlds. Uh, one guy thinks he can go to Ukraine and make his home. Uh, and the whole sky is then filled with all these clouds of greed and, desire, uh, and, and desires that are black. And then it makes us blur and we can't see what's the future. Like the matrix, right? They pollute the sky so the robots can't see anything. And when all this greed and desire fills up the sky, when clouds form too big, of course it falls to the ground. And all this little greed and unbearable things fall to the ground and it sinks into the sea like the carbon sink. So all these little things, bad habits, become absorbed like a bad carbon and they drop into the water. So it's, in a way, it's like a metaphor because actually most of the carbon 
the strongest habitat for carbon is actually in the sea, if you realize that. Um, then followed by tundra, you know, seagrass has actually a lot of ability to store carbon. That's why people plant seaweeds. Uh, then followed by mangrove, then peat swamp, then the rainforest. So the best storage of carbon comes from the sea and then slowly goes up to the land. So when the carbon goes to the sea, it stores there and then let's make our way up to the land. Within this area, there's a lot of little, little carbons, little bubbles that are trapped. And over time, all these plants, because it's very rich in nutrients, they start to crawl in and try to find all this greed and desire trapped as money or carbon. So you have all these little creatures trying to find gold. So more and more lives start to go around all these little sea creatures area where it's rich of nutrients. And the plants soon evolve around this area, right? And all these roots start growing. But soon, as you know, if a place is too much wealth, you know, everyone comes in, right? Like Bitcoin, you know? remember that? Everyone starts to go in. And then what happens? Sardines. Not good. Huh? Too crowded. So what happens if it's too crowded? In the metro, you're too crowded. You get out. So. This is evolution. I don't know if you believe it or not, but we do <laughs> for this story. The Titanic decides to get up because the sea is too crowded. So it takes a break. It goes out from the sea. It's like, you know what? I want to be anti-social and I want to be not part of the crowd. Bye. Adios. Ciao. Goes up. And then it goes up and then it stays there because it's not used to the land, right? It's comfortable with the sea, but the sea has too many of its friends who are too gossipy and Kanye is there spewing all this bullshit. It goes up and it stays between the mud. And the mud is something like the mangrove. The mangrove is half between water and half between land. It gets the best of both worlds. Yeah, so it's a confluence uh, between two, land and sea, and syncretic which is a combination of different styles and beliefs. So the Titanic, once it goes up to the mud lens, it's like, oh, not bad, I get sunlight here, not bad, I can, you know, bronze a bit, why not? <laughs> and then it goes and ventures up to the mountains, and it sees this mystical kingdom that is, has all these little trees, and it's like, wow, this is what I want, because have, all this carbon is stored here, and they're all absorbing it from the sky. So I don't need to get it from the sea because, you know, huh, stupid, they're just fighting for leftover scraps. I have the sky. And then it, saw a, it sees a king from this magical kingdom riding a bicycle. Wow, how eco-friendly. It's like, mm, I want to be like this guy. He knows what's up. But I like to travel. So I want to build a house that is filled with all these little forests. And then he thinks, hmm, how, how do I actually build my house by a forest? So he studied the forest and he realized that, you know, trees, when they are young, they can actually weave very easily because like, like a baby, when you teach him new stuff, it's easy for them to adapt. Whereas adults, you know, when you tell them about certain things, they're like, <laughs> you know? So he learned how to weave and pleat using trees, continue weaving and pleating, and he studied he came upon France and he saw Francis Halle. He's like, wow, you do this? Damn, I want to learn. <laughs> so he studied like Francis Halle. He studied how trees grow, how he shaped all these little trees into what the shape he desired. You know, many, many different forms. So he's the master of forming nature. And he said, what did he say? Give me a tree and I will save the world, he said. Wow. And he also studied this art of uh, engineering of trees and botany. It's called Bau Botanik, it's German. Weave the trees together to form impressive engineered timber structures that are actually strong. And then he also looked at the sea because that's where he came from. And he realized that when you have ropes in some East African nations, that's how they collect salt, because salt lands on ropes, and that's where they can collect from the salt. 
And then he thought, wow, the weaving techniques are impressive. And that's how I can get sought by osmosis. So he started studying how they connect the ropes and build the connection. Slowly, 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 weave together a ship that is made of trees, ropes, and built from organic material to form a nice boat. And what is on this boat? Because like what he learned in the sea, when carbon sinks into the ocean, it remains there. And people fight for it and new life grows. So within the ship, the leaf litter planted in the ship and the trees are sunk into the ship and they are stayed there forever. I think that is one criticism that we are trying to prove in our design as well, that you know, when you do a lot of gardening, it's actually not good for the environment because the leaf litter that traps the carbon is being thrown away. So you're actually producing more carbon. You want the leaf to stay on the ground. And that's what we do. And then he sees a lighthouse that guiding it to the ship. This one, I don't know how to say it. <laughs> this, is this is because uh, Hua Yen is inspired by one of her uh, friend's kids that watched Chainsaw Man. I don't know if you'll watch it. It's like a manga, anime. I watched it at 4 a.m. this morning, trying to understand what it is. It's quite cool, actually. Yeah. So we imagine this, this city that we created have all these little evil creatures that try to destroy everything they built. You know, because every good story needs to have a good villain, right? Not too bad. And then from this little city, the ship that has all these resources, it goes around every single city, stopping by Cameroon, right? To do trading. So what you have, you have sugar, you have plants, and firewood, they trade with each other to create this economy, to sustain the people living there. Yeah? And the guardians of these areas in the Cameroon are none other than the strong women there. Because in Cameroon, actually, most of the women are actually the fighters for the ecology. They are the ones that are planting the mangroves uh, in the area and actually helping out to protect the nature and the wildlife there. Don't know what the men are doing. Some beautiful images. <laughs> so it shows how they are working with the mango shit. Oh, someone died. It's a chainsaw monkey. Why do we put a chainsaw monkey inside? You have to explain it. I, I still haven't get it yet. <laughs> yeah. And then from Cameroon, where there's a tigers and a chainsaw monkey to fight against, it sails to a little island called Singapore, which happens to be in this year a floating solar city because it has been ad completely absorbed by climate change because of 20 meters sea level rise, why not? And they rob the daylight of every creature living in the sea because why not floating solar panels for the humans? The entire city powered by solar filled with glass. Glitzy. It robs the sunlight from all humans and robs the sunlight from all nature to power this utopia that's made from mirror, glass, and radiance. And then from here, it goes on to visit Venice, the most prominent city, in fact, the poster child of climate change, because everyone knows it. And I think uh, Amitav Ghosh, he mentioned two cities, uh, Venice and Sundarban, they are both facing climatic issues now. And Venice is probably the most appropriate location to stop 
this uh, this ship at because it's the poster child of sinking. So we of course know the city of Venice from all these paintings that are sinking. Every year it gets funnier with more and more videos showing how people cross the street and the square of the flooding. So everywhere you look like there's evidence of enchantment of decay, of a kind of beauty that can only be revealed by a long, slow fading that you see every year Venice goes sunken in the sea. And of course, we give this character that painted all this image a squid-like face, and he asks, what is intelligence in 1.31 million years' time? This is, we haven't given a name to this guy yet. Am I better than everyone? Maybe. So this AI Am one I day came up and drew all these photos and thinks that, hmm, humans are no longer Am needed. I I'm so, I'm better. Better than everyone? Am I better than everyone? But it thinks again, and then it thinks, there was once a human from Singapore told him that humans are not the final form of evolution because we always think that we are the final form of evolution, like the final boss that can conquer everything. But what we do know is that Earth is way longer than us humans have ever survived. And we have also created within this short time living in planet Earth and evolving here with all these mystical creatures. In 1.31 million years time, will we still exist? And this creature goes up from the sea because he lives in the sea, puts on his mask to go to the land because he can't stand the land and goes into the forest and hides there because he learns that, you know, all humans want to retire in the forest, apparently. So, the lesson here is, the question that we ask here is, can all lives be financially independent? If we give value to every living species, can we create a more equitable world? If you shower a giraffe with money, can it buy the latest, trendiest scarf against the cold? And this is in line with the change of bioethics. As I said, 33, 33, 33, and 1. is where we think whether or not we as humans have a necessary responsibility to give a value to species that are not other than us and stop creating that boundary thinks that we are better than everyone because in the future, a robot might think that as well and we are just the others. And if we can find out the economic system that works, that benefits uh, all these species, called interspecies money, if we can help when, they, when we protect these species, we get rewarded, they get rewarded, is it a better way to survive or is it a, just a new form of capitalism? Is it that bad? Not sure. So a wise old man said that there was a time in the 19th century where it was perfect for us to enslave people, right? I think you all know who he is, that he said that. So, but within 20, 30 years, suddenly becomes distasteful. Like in the World Cup now, people talk about uh, LGBTQ rights uh, in Qatar. But if you think back in England, where they host the World Cup in 50 years ago, it was equally outlawed as well there as well. So what gives us the moral standard and the moral right to say something here now? Or are humans that flexible, on the other hand, to say that because within 20 years, we have enlightened ourselves to take a stand, to move forward, to say this is what we want, and we want to assign value for a change in bioethics because we now come to realisation that whatever we did in the past was wrong, and from today onwards, we denounce that, we give value to other species as well. Yep, so is there hope? Can rewilding nature, can we build a mangrove boat that puts us back into the right track of climate change, in the right side of history, and in the right side of non-extinction? We don't know. But maybe there's another species in the future that will tell this story, and maybe it's the robot that will tell our story 
or maybe it's us in the future telling the story that we did it. So, in the City of Lights, where concrete reigns supreme, Francis Halle did a dream of a wilder scene. He saw the trees and flowers reclaim the streets, and the birds and bees return to their sweet treats. A vision of a bowl of rewilding Paris, a green oasis where nature can flourish. Thank you. This is also generated by AI. I didn't write the poem. <laughs> so, thank you. That's all of the lecture. Um, follow us on Instagram. This is my company, The Salad. Uh, connect with us. We do a lot of interesting updates there and storytelling. And of course, if you have good ideas and keen to collaborate with us, we are trying to put this in Venice Biennale as a story, as an exhibition that propose a future of interspecies money, a future for change in bioethics, and of course, a future for us to think beyond just ourselves. Thank you. It, 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 it's very interesting because uh, <laughs> Quentin has his own interpretation of the story, some of the small detail, and this is where it's fun. Because we have been giving uh, lectures a lot, and nowadays the lectures are filled up with data, with information, and all these kind of things happening. Um, so we decided to do a little story. Uh, we didn't show him until this morning. And then we, uh, I got him to talk, so he got some of the, the story in a more interesting way, maybe, or less interesting way than what we originally imagined. Um, it, it was about a, a boat, actually. We are, we are seeing whether we can build it, uh, even a model of it that is three meters long. Um, and it, it's supposed to travel around the world. What you saw, the four countries, uh, Cameroon, uh, Venice, Singapore, as well as Sundarban, which is in uh, Bangladesh, uh, they all suffer from the same thing, which is the sea level rising. Uh, and it's, it's, it's forcing the cities to have to retreat uh, or come out with a new solution. Uh, obviously, this has a lot to do with carbon absorption, carbon sinking, and uh, carbon embodying. So this, this fleet uh, that's supposed to come uh, is supposed to then absorb the carbon uh, from the city, what it produces, uh, there will be uh, rainforests uh, sitting on top, learning from mangrove. Uh, we'll use osmosis to absorb the seawater and produce salt. And then from there, it will travel from places to places. And using interspecies money, which uh, uses a blockchain to kind of give value to different animals and different beings or even different ecosystems or even different uh, human beings. Sometimes uh, how people see uh, different kind of uh, races and all this are what we are keen to see whether the new technology can change uh, the equality of everyone. So that's, that's what it is. And it wasn't supposed to be a robot uh, going into the forest. The robot all retreat to the forest and a new species of uh, sea being, a new intelligence take over. <laughs> uh, but that, that's his story. Uh, you can actually, well, you have seen the story. You can form your own story. Uh, these are all done by mid-journey. I'm not sure whether you use it. Don't use it lazily for, for your um, presentation, but I think you can use it creatively. Uh, I, was, I was talking to Walter, and I think he was working on uh, uh, mid-journey a while ago, and uh, it's, it's something that is like a tool. It, it's like a pencil. It's like a pen, and you can always use it. So if you have any question to ask? Yes. I think the, the, the idea you saw, 33, 33, 33, and 1, we always think ecosystem belongs to just nature. Um, as we move on in our, uh, you know, 
the current situation, we understand that um, there's a need to relook at what ecosystem means. I think in Singapore, everything is quite artificial, so we are planning to look at how to create a e new ecosystem as well as with technology. Also with machines and how certain area on the rooftop can be cordoned off and not allow people to go in. Um, this, we're talking about 25 floors or even uh, 20 floors where the roof garden is really shut down and the only way to see it is through sensors uh, also through machines, through robots, and you can connect to digital screen and all this. We're pushing this project at this moment. Um, those are really ecosystems that will be maintained by ecologists as well as technology. So it's quite different from what we always imagine that gardens uh, or ecosystem uh, either belongs to just nature or belongs to human controlling it. I think it's a combination of all three together and how we can work this out because we are all living on the same earth. Yeah, I think it's interesting question because uh, at Woha, where I worked at, um, a lot of uh, times we also don't know what ecosystem will uh, result because you can study the forest, but in the urban context, it's very different. And a lot of times as architects, we are hypothesizing the future. That's what the power of us in and the, the education of architecture is, right? Is to learn all you can like a conductor, learn all you can, but we don't know how to play on the instruments, but we hypothesize the future, and because it's going to build in 10 years' time, the future is there. So in some of our buildings where it's super green, we actually did research after that the building is done to find out what kind of species live there. And the results sometimes are quite surprising. Like um, Oasia Hotel, for instance, we find squirrels that actually climb more than 100 meters to the sky. And this, if you ask the ecologist, right, they will tell you the same thing. They will always tell you, ah, you are crazy, it's not possible. But the data shows that if you build something, the animals are adaptable. And if you build something pleasant, they actually climb that high. So we are also learning. So a lot of this time we're saying, I like to use the word prototype. It's always a prototype to make us build better, build more sustainable, and build more ecological uh, in the future. And that's what we're learning about. And the ecosystem, as you see, the buildings that we built uh, seven years ago is still changing. We are still learning. We're still perfecting. We're still trying to figure out what's the best way to make it work. Yeah. So, yeah. I think e ecosystem is a term for beings. So, for example, in Dubai, um, it was a meeting between a digital ecosystem, uh, which I was struggling to understand because when you talk to people that deal with digital, uh, the way they see how the whole system is running with different kind of apps or you know, even back-end robots uh, and appliances and all this. It, 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 and what we try to do is then combine the digital ecosystem with the natural, natural ecosystem. So that is a certain way of answering your question of whether there is a new ecosystem to look at. Um, then again, it is at this moment that we are trying to understand deep time through evolution and we're starting to understand more about ecology. And I actually think that architects should spend more time trying to understand other ecosystem than just about the communal ecosystem, and then maybe using the two, the, the three ecosystem to try to resolve issues that we are in. <laughs> Any more question? Yes. Oh. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, so it's good. Because I've been trying to get the game uh, uh, functioning again. Uh, it's a lot of uh, contract issues <laughs> and IP problems. But um, the game is actually very simple. You have a fixed amount of energy and fixed amount of water according to how much water is, is drawn in the day and how much energy was drawn in the day. Of course, it will be previous day data that's fit into the system. And then from there, there will be little droplets that you can collect from the air and you can plant trees. So if the day is very bad, you can't plant too many trees. And there will be some questions along the way thinking that, oh, 
uh, if you go to school, like you take a bus or you take a metro or you take a Ferrari, you know, and then it will reduce the amount of energy you have. <laughs> so it's a very simple game. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, the game was something really new also for a landscape architect who deals with uh, plants. It was quite fascinating for us to you look at uh, the world in a different way. Uh, what the game really does is that uh, we make sure everyone wins so that it can trigger the tree animation that you saw. Um, it's supposed to be interactive um, as well as generative, meaning that the original idea was to write algorithms uh, so that the cloud, I don't know whether you saw it, but the cloud is uh, supposed to change according to the amount of carbon that's in the, in the pavilion, um, which is a real phenomenon. If you get too much carbon, and we'll get less cloud, and we'll get more solar UV coming down at us. So Do you design game? Uh, we, 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 we like to work with game designers, yeah, actually, yeah, be because good. gamification is something that is really quite strategic in moving and very good storytelling most of the time. And we will make NFT for that as well. Yeah, he, he's going to make NFT and make <laughs> me rich. <laughs> Any other questions? You want to speak in French and I'll get my friend to translate. <laughs> So this is a very interesting question because uh, a lot of different species need very specific kind of environment to survive. And of course, the one that is staying in the city, what you are looking at, are very adaptive. So we do spend some time in the rainforest because we are in Singapore. Of course, if you're in France, then you spend time in the forest. Um, and we try to learn all the little minute thing, then uh, today, again, with data and information, it's a lot easier to get precision. And then you try to reproduce that uh, with the plants or the soil and the environment that can be as suitable as possible. Uh, and then this, this is calibrated most of the time, but also we don't push too far. Uh, obviously, the current intention is to try to bring back uh, animals that are easier to adapt themselves. And given time, the production rate is very high to, to be able to replace that. Uh, again, the monitoring with uh, AI, with robots, are something that is about precision. So it can be adjusted. It's not far from doing gardens. Actually, if you think about garden, uh, initially, people can't bring a lot of, they only have a few types of plants as around. But over years, when you look at it, uh, it is done in a very different way. We're not encouraging uh, invasive species to be introduced. Uh, although rewilding did say that uh, you can reintroduce a uh, hippo, hippopotamus to, to Paris because it used to exist uh, a creature that looks like this. Um, it's a very small step. I think the complexity of an ecosystem is what we are looking at when we talk about rewilding. Uh, you want to translate? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so do you know any Netflix producer? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
this this is a utopia question. So when you look at the the D3, the D3, the D3 and one, there's always that one that is really unknown. I think we are not engineers. We are, you are architect by training. I'm, oh, I was also trained as architect, but uh, I'm a landscape architect now, but we also deal with art. We know that there's no ideal situation. We know that everything is a continuum. And it, it's not about one single idea that will rule the world. In fact, this is not as if they were really gonna build it, but it is to inspire you to move on to today, to relook at the whole way of seeing architecture, uh, to look at other beings, to look at digital, your own tools that I think you know, all of you have, and how you can use it. Uh, you don't have to always look back, but then again, if you look at some of the things that we're presenting, obviously we do study deep time. We study back all the way into uh, at least Cambrian period or pre-Cambrian period, which lives were formed. Uh, initially for a landscape architect, that sounds really ridiculous, but then as uh, we, you know, COVID is something very interesting because uh, it gave everyone a lot of time. You don't travel that much, you don't spend time on the journey and all this. So uh, I, I, I started to learn about uh, even uh, the 1.5, I don't know, 150 million or the years ago, what was really happening. And you, you can learn quite a few things, and I think these are things that are um, really changing. Uh, we're not building a utopia. Always bear that in mind, there's, there's no such thing as utopia. Uh, uh, I think uh, religion and uh, all this, uh, maybe there's utopia, but uh, I think when we are all on Earth, we have to remember that one percent. And stay poetic, I think it's, it's not an engineer game here. Well, we're, not, we're not calculating precision so that all, all the carbon can sink down, but uh, that, that's human, right? We, we move on. Any other questions? I think to work with AI itself to produce this, uh, it's something that is unknown. I think the difference between art and design that's very clear is it's not giving you an answer. I think art gives you a chance to question on how you will be inspired to move. Meanwhile, design, sometimes we have to give an absolute solution for the client to be happy. Uh, the art of it inside here, obviously, is uh, are we the only one that is able to create? Do we believe that humans are the only one that is able to create? Uh, should we not look at other beings, uh, which is the same? Should we not look at other human beings sometimes when it comes to how we create things? And uh, it's a relationship, I think. And relationship has no solution. I think art is a relationship. It is always forming new relationship. You form relationship with my mic, you form with a wire, or you form with anything. Contemporary art is all about that. So you form new relationship with uh, different kind of things. Any other questions? Can, can you repeat? <laughs> Why we don't see? Uh, yeah. Uh, you are saying why we don't see this type of style uh, in the Western society and uh, in uh, Singapore or Asian cities is a bit more futuristic looking. Um, I grapple that question myself as well because we do have projects uh, across the globe and in Europe as well. And 
sometimes it's, it's hard to determine what is futuristic and not. You know, I have friends from Poland that visit me recently and they're oh, you know, it was Singapore, it was magnifique, you know, it's so futuristic. I was like, no, it's, it's, it's <laughs> I see this every day. You know, it's normal. To me, like, Paris is amazing, you know. I think it's perception and cultural differences, but also a lot of materiality style, the cost, the labor involved, and also a lot of uh, different types of design approach and pedagogy. Um, it's not to say that it's not possible in Paris result in two different uh, approaches of facade design, right? So Singapore, of course, is scarred by certain uh, results of certain fires back in the history. Therefore, they have certain codes that are not in line with the EU code, for instance, or the UK code. But UK is scarred by certain history like Grenfell Tower, and they have certain design criteria and design styles from that on. So it's very cultural and very contextual in a way. So can we recreate this in Paris? Absolutely possible, but it will have to adhere to the Parisian context and the local uh, systems. I, I don't think that it's easier in the Asian cities. <laughs> I think your question is uh, interesting because there's a tendency to still believe between the East and the West, which uh, I think is economy that you're asking. Uh, it seems that Asia is building a lot. Um, and in that a lot, sometimes you do see one or two projects that seems to shine. Um, are we doing better futuristic buildings? Not at all. Not at all, I can tell you. Uh, and uh, this term futuristic is a very big question. Uh, I, I, I don't think it is about that. Um, but after you graduate, obviously Asia offer more buildings to be built because it, uh, the infrastructure is a lot more backward and uh, it's easier to remove. And therefore that's, that's what you have been seeing. Um, Example, uh, again, not true again. Uh, we talk about Francis Ale, who uh, is the one that started to understand uh, the tropical rainforest. Uh, there, there is no such thing in your generation between uh, East and the West that at least I hope for. Uh, at least I'm here now from uh, quite far away to give a talk to you and you, you are asking questions at least. So I think the, all this will change. Uh, it, it's a very interesting period of time. Uh, your generation has a future. Yeah. In Singapore, people will never ask questions. <laughs> yeah. But it's not forbidden, they're shy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And then, and then they... <laughs> I think it's just a culture that was not trained to ask questions. We we like to work in uh, instruction. The Asians like to work in instruction, so you see them better at team sport uh, and not at individual sport. Uh, to you, this might be something interesting that there's a lot of cooperation, but there's a lot of oppression sometimes. It, it, it's, it's not true. There uh, is purely cooperation as well. Um, again, this happened throughout the whole world. It's not only Asia. Uh, it, it's something to do with us human. Any more questions? Someone try last question. How about that? Yes. Uh, yes, ac actually, we, we, we look forward to exchange, I mean, with, with the world, of course, always. I think it's, it's, it's always, you know, during COVID, what, what really happened? Uh, well, we accept, that, that's the answer. What I really had time was to spend, uh, I, I really had time to spend with my daughter, who was then 
16 years old, and uh, I started to learn from her. I, I you know, it, it's, it, it, this, this exchange, even you asking questions, I'm processing in my brain that, you know, am I a dinosaur, or am I getting too old, I don't understand what you are asking. Uh, when, uh, what's your French name? Kong Chan, and I was talking, uh, because he's, he's 33, I'm 46. I'm also processing what he's, he's saying because he talks about Kenya West and all these people. Um, it's different generation, but uh, I think the power behind human being is uh, we have connective power. And that's when you can change your habit. That's it? Yeah. Oh, yes. I want to be myself again, actually. <laughs> uh, you know, first thing first, I, uh, even though I was born a Buddhist, I, I don't really believe in karma. Um, uh, you know, uh, but uh, on the other hand, I, I try to live my life without regret. Uh, obviously, there are failures in life and all this, but uh, I want to be myself. Always, uh, there's there's nothing that I I wish it to be changed. So again, that answer back uh, is there a utopia? I think what you go through in your life, you have to accept. That's the only utopia that you have. <laughs> Thank you. Merci à tous. Bonsoir.